Thank you for joining me on this video. My name is Rodney Constable. I am the president and founder of Simple Market Signals at SimpleMarketSignals.com. Simple Market Signals helps you understand both the direction of the trend and the level of risk in the stock market through our proprietary indicators that are emailed to you every weekend in our weekly stock market-based newsletter, all for less than $20 per month. Today, we will be doing technical analysis on the S&P 500 for the week ending Friday, July 10th, 2020. For this analysis, we will be using StockCharts.com. That is the charting service that I use and pay for. And I will leave a link to their site in the description box below this video. This week, we were up 1.76% on the S&P 500 and closed at 3185.04. The first chart that we're looking at is a year-to-date weekly candlestick chart of the S&P 500. The blue line is set at 3,000, and the orange line is the 40-week moving average equivalent to the 200-day moving average. And as we can see here, we've now had the seventh week in a row where we have closed above 3,000 on the S&P 500. So that is good news, and we can see here that, that all but one week over the last seven, we have closed above this 40-week moving average. So from a technical standpoint, uh, things continue to look good. However, below the surface, you know, that perhaps is another story. So just keep in mind, folks, that just because we continue to close above the 40-week moving average, the 200-day moving average, of course, and the, uh, the 3,000 level on the S&P 500, it doesn't mean that this is a riskless environment. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that risk is still not out there. So just keep that in mind as we go through this presentation. The next chart that we're looking at here is a one-year weekly candlestick chart. The blue line now is set at 3,200. It's important to note that where we're at right now, again, we closed at 3,185.04. There has only been 10 weeks where the S&P 500 has closed above 3,200 in the entire history of the S&P 500. We've only had 10 weekly closes above 3,200. So we are getting back into rarefied air here. And we can see that a few weeks ago here towards the uh, end of May, beginning of June, we got up here and challenged and tried to close above 3,200 and we failed. So the question now is this time around, can we get up to and close above and start to consistently close above this 3,200 level on the S&P 500 anytime soon. Only time will tell, but just understand that the last 10 closes above 3,200, and by the way, the last one was that same week back in February where we hit the all-time highs. February 19th, our all-time high in the S&P 500 was 3,386.15. That's the all-time closing high so far for the S&P 500, and it was that week, that was the last week that we've closed above 3,200 on the S&P 500. So uh, it's been quite a while and the earnings were much higher back then, right? So last year, 2019, we finished up over $162 per composite share, right? The earnings were 162 and change per composite share on the S&P 500. This year, we're going to be lucky if we're only down 20 to 25 percent year over year on earnings. And yet we're getting back to where we're trying to get up and challenge the all-time highs. And again, we're doing it with a lot lower earnings per share than what we saw last year. So I hope you're understanding that it's P.E. expansion that is causing this. It's not earnings increases. And keep in mind, guys, there's only two things that go into a stock price, the earnings and the multiple that investors are paying for those earnings. And right now, we have declining earnings for 2020 over 2019. So therefore, the only way we're going to continue to get back up and challenge and perhaps get above this 3,400 level, which of course would be a new all-time high in the S&P 500, it's expanding multiples. It's you and I and the other investors out there paying more and more and more for a dollar of earnings. So just keep that in mind as this market gets up to and tries to go higher and tries to go above this 3,200 level. We're doing it with lower earnings, but expanding multiples. So just keep that in the back of your mind.
Now we're looking at a five-day, five-minute candlestick chart of the S&P 500, and we can see that there was a lot of volatility in the stock market this week, and we hit our lows of the week yesterday on Thursday, the 9th of July, just after 11 o'clock in the morning, and we had over a 2% rally from that point and finished up at the highs of the week. So uh, pretty interesting that we went from the lows to the highs of the week in um, less than two days. But this helped to get us up over that 3180 area, and uh, we closed at the highs of the week. And you can see on Friday alone here, we were up a little over 1% on the S&P 500. The next chart that we're going to look at is an hourly chart of the S&P 500, and this goes back to May 26th. And as we can see here, the bulk of the trading on the S&P 500 since May 26th has been between 3,000 on the low end and about 3,180 on the high end. Now, what's also interesting is the last hourly candle for this week, as you can see here over on, on the right where my cursor is circling, that is the last candle for the week and it's the first time since June 5th as you can see here okay it's the first time since June 5th that we've had an hourly close where we had a candle an hourly candle that closed above 3180 and as we can see here we had a few days where we closed above 3180 got back and uh, actually hit that high candle you know since the downturn right this candle here that I'm circling has been the peak that we've hit so far since the downturn at uh, just a little over 32.30, as you can see here over on the right, and then we sold off from there. So it will be interesting to see if we have now broken above and broken out of this trading range between 3,000 and 3,180. As you can see, it's been a real tough slog here to get up over that. You know, is this an anomaly? Will we roll back over next week? Or can we consistently start to close above this 3180 level and then get over the 3200 hump and consistently start to close above that? And especially on a weekly basis, continue to close above that 3200 level. I don't think it's going to be very easy, but only time will tell. So we will need to keep our eye on that. But uh, this was, you know, from a technical standpoint, this looks really good the fact that we now closed for the first time since clear back in you know for for over a month it was the first time we had an hourly close above this level so again that all looks good but as we go through the next few charts i think you're going to see that this market looks a little frothy here so don't assume that just because we had some strength towards the end of the week here in the trading that uh you know, that, that this is a, uh, a risk-free environment because this is anything but a risk-free environment. The next chart that we're looking at is a five-year weekly candlestick chart of the XLK. Now, the XLK is the tech sector. That's the ETF that tracks the tech sector of the S&P 500. And the tech sector has really been the leading sector, uh, it's by weight, it's the largest sector of the S&P 500, and it has had the strongest strength for quite a while in the S&P 500. So the XLK is really what has been leading, been holding up, been propping up the S&P 500. So it's important for us to understand what's going on with the XLK. Now, one of the things I want you guys to understand is we once again had an all-time closing high on a weekly basis on the XLK. So that's all well and good, but look at the gap. Look at how far above this 40-week moving average, the blue line where my cursor is moving. Look at how far above the 40-week moving average we are now trading on the XLK. That is a long distance. It's about 18, 19% above that long-term moving average. And generally when you get that high, like we were back in, we're about the same distance above this on a percentage basis back in February, you can see that's when you correct back towards the 40-week moving average. Now, I'm not saying it's going back to the 40 anytime soon, but it's something to keep an eye on. And you can look over the last five years, you know, you generally have a nice run on this XLK above the 40, but, you know, you're generally not this far above it, okay? So we're pretty far extended above the long-term moving average. And by the way, the green line is the 10 week or equivalent to the 50 day moving average and you can see that we've uh, you know we've had a really nice run above that 50 as well and uh, we're you know pretty far extended above the 50 day 10 week moving average as well on the XLK the tech sector within the S&P 500 so if 
the tech sector starts to roll over anytime soon, my guess is that that probably takes the rest of the market down with it. You know, might we have some sector rotation where other sectors uh, make up the difference? It's possible, but mathematically, it's not very probable given the fact that the XLK has the, uh, you know, the tech sector has the highest weighting within the S&P 500. So if the tech sector starts to roll over, more than likely that will be very negative for the S&P 500, at least in the short term. Now we're looking at a very similar chart, except now we're looking at the triple Qs, the NASDAQ 100. Again, this is a very hot, quote unquote, hot tech and biotech heavy index, and it generally has very, very good performance. But again, you can see that the triple Qs hit an all-time weekly closing high. Again, this week, we were up over 4.5% this week on the triple Qs. Look at how far extended over the 40-week moving average the triple Qs are. When you're looking at things like that, you know, look at the history. Look at over the last five years. We generally, yeah, it, it trades above the 40-week moving average, and it kind of rides just above the 10 week for quite a while, as you can see here. But when you get these huge gaps above the 10 week, above the 40 week moving average, that tells you that you're getting pretty far extended and that the likelihood of a pullback is high. It doesn't mean it's going to happen, you know, in the next week or two, however it could. But when you start to see these huge gaps over these long term moving averages, it should at least get you prepared for the possibility the likelihood of a reversal in that trend, at least in the short term. So we have, uh, we've come a long way in a short period of time. The moving averages are telling us this. The gap over the moving averages on the triple Qs are telling us this. I think being a little cautious here and expecting a pullback at least to the 10-week moving average, if not to the 40-week moving average, on the XLK, on the triple Qs, at some point in the not too distant future, I think that type of an expectation is going to keep you from getting hurt. We cannot expect these tech stocks to continue to rally at this pace. I just don't see that it's sustainable. The earnings, yes, tech is probably better than most of the other sectors. However, the earnings on the tech sector, from everything I've seen, are not keeping pace with the price appreciation in the underlying stocks. So caution is advised here. And the next chart that we're going to look at here is the five-year weekly chart of the IWM. The IWM is the ETF that tracks the Russell 2000. And here we can see that the Russell 2000, the small caps here in the U.S., are trading beneath their 40-week moving average. Many of you maybe have seen this chart in the past. I show it on a fairly frequent basis just to point out that there's still a lot of underlying weakness beyond large cap tech. Large cap tech is about really what, uh, what's been working and a few other large cap stocks in the S&P 500. But the majority of stocks in the U.S., the majority of stocks around the world are not doing all that well. And that's what's so important for us to understand. Breadth out there is not that good, guys. And we can see it here in the small caps. It's really hard to have a really strong healthy, sustainable uptrend in the stock market if you don't have small cap participation. And we do not have small cap participation right now. The small caps, the Russell 2000, which is a pretty broad benchmark for the U.S. small caps trading beneath the 40-week moving average. And at this price level, you can see if we go to the left, you can see that clear back in 2017, is when we hit first hit these price levels in the IWM, the Russell 2000. So we're trading at price levels that we first saw back in 2017 in these small caps. And we peaked in August of 2018 in the IWM. We came back and tried to challenge those highs in January of 2020, but we couldn't quite get there. We couldn't quite uh, match or eclipse the highs that we had made back in August of 2018. So this right here should give you caution. We do not have good breadth in this market. We don't have small cap participation. It's large cap tech that has been leading the way. And that's great, except that really cannot make a sustainable stock market. We can't have a good, strong stock market with just large cap tech and a few other stocks leading the way. 
Now what we're looking at is a chart of the S&P 500 for the first three months of 2020. So January through March. And I've annotated this chart with these simple market signals signals to show you how simple market signals can help you understand the risk levels and the changing risk levels in the stock market and how simple market signals can help you manage your risk. The simple market signals are green, yellow, and red. Green is the lowest risk level in the stock market. And what you're going to find is the stock market makes most of its upward progress when the signal is green. When the signal is yellow, that means that risk levels are starting to rise. And what we can expect in a yellow environment is sideways to slightly up or down price action. And the red signal is the worst signal in the model. And you're going to find that the worst sell-offs, including bear markets, happen when the signal is red. So let's walk through this and see how this works. So we came into the year with a pretty strong stock market, as we know, and the signal was green for the majority of January of 2020. On the 27th, the signal went to yellow, and we had a yellow signal for about two weeks here. As we can see here, the signal went back to green for a few weeks. We know that we hit our all-time high in the stock market on Wednesday, February 19th, 2020, where the S&P 500 closed at 3386.15. And then we had this negative reversal that I had talked about in my newsletter to my subscribers. And I had told them that I did not like this price action because we did not have the follow through. We hit that all time high in the stock market. And then we had this negative reversal sold off on Thursday and Friday. And so in the newsletter that went out on Saturday, February 22nd, I was warning my subscribers that I felt like something was changing and that they should be ready to take defensive measures and protect profits. And sure enough, the signal went yellow on Monday, February 24th. So I hope you guys are paying attention to how this can really help you manage your risk. And think about what happened here, okay? We had an all-time high in the market, and then just a few days later, the model showed that there was rising risk, and the signal went yellow on the 24th. Now, over and above the risk signals, I have trend indicators in this model the longer term trend indicator called the general trend indicator went negative the very next day on 225. Okay. So the signal went yellow, right? On Monday, the 24th on Tuesday, the 25th, the general trend indicator went negative. So there's two warnings right there, right? That something is not right in the stock market. And by the way, the general trend indicator had been positive since October of 2019. Okay. Since early October, 2019. So think about that. The signal went yellow the very next day. The trend indicator went negative. That trend indicator had been positive for months. Okay, so there's numerous ways that simple market signals can help you manage your risk. So there's two things right there within two days that could have told people that they probably should take some profits, rebalance their portfolios, take defensive measures, buy puts, however you want to protect your portfolio, right? That's up to you. But you can see here how this is working. And then by Thursday, the 27th, the signal had gone red, okay? And by the way, that signal went red at around 3,000 on the S&P 500. And your first warning came out at about 3,250, okay? So, and the second one came out somewhere, you know, around 3,100. Let's just call it 3,100. So you had numerous warnings all within one week. You had, you had a yellow signal. You had a negative general trend indicator. Again, that thing had been positive for months. And then the signal went red. And as we know, the market sold off very hard from there. Guys, this is just one example, but a very recent example of how simple market signals can help protect you. Okay. And regardless of whether you're trading the S&P 500, the DIA, the triple Qs, individual stocks, the correlations in the stock market is they're so high these days that if you understand what's going on with the S&P 500, and my model is based on the S&P 500, but if you can understand what's going on with the S&P 500, irrespective of what you're trading, it will help you understand the general direction and the general risk levels in the stock market. Okay. Because as we know, 70, 80, 90% of all stocks go in the same general direction as the S&P 500. So if we can understand what's happening with the S&P 500, it gives us a huge advantage in trying to manage our risk and protect our profits with our investments. Okay, a quick refresher on the simple market signals, weekly signals, and how they can help you. The signals are green, yellow, and red. 
The green signal is the best risk reward ratio for equity investors. And what you're going to find is that the stock market makes most of its upward progress when the signal is green. Okay. The worst risk reward ratio signal for equity investors is when the signal is red. And what you're going to find is that bear markets and the worst downturns in the stock market happen when the signal is red, like during the 07 through 09 bear market, as we see here. So again, the best risk reward ratio signal for equity investors is when the signal is green. And the worst risk reward signal for equity investors is when the signal is red. As part of the simple market signals model, there are three powerful indicators. There's the simple market signals proprietary risk level signal. There's the short term trend indicator, which helps clarify short term moves in the overall U.S. stock market. And a normal signal length for the short term trend indicator is anywhere from one or two days to seven plus weeks. Then there's the general trend indicator, which is designed to stay positive during the bulk of most uptrends and negative during the bulk of most downtrends. And a normal signal length for the general trend indicator is anywhere from two weeks to five plus months. We disseminate the information through the Simple Market Signals weekly newsletter. In the weekly newsletter, you will receive the proprietary risk level signal on the overall U.S. stock market. You will also receive the proprietary risk level signal on all 11 major sectors of the S&P 500. You will also receive the short-term trend indicator signal. You will also receive the general trend indicator signal. You will also receive market and sector performance information over multiple time frames. You will receive a recap of what happened in the stock market for the past week. You'll also receive technical analysis information, fundamental analysis information, and yield curve information. There is a ton of information every week in the Simple Market Signals newsletter. And a subscription to Simple Market Signals is just $19.95 per month. That's less than $0.67 cents per day. It's billed monthly on your credit card. There are no contracts. You can cancel any time. And your first two weeks are free. And, guys, I want to set realistic expectations here, okay? The newsletter isn't fancy. It's effective. It's plain text, no color, no fluff. And please note that due to international compliance regulations, you must be at least 18 years old and a citizen of the United States of America who is currently living in the U.S. in order to subscribe to Simple Market Signals. And again, that is just due to international compliance regulations. Now let's recap what you will get with your Simple Market Signals subscription. You will get the weekly emailed newsletter with all of the contents we just talked about, you will also receive special midweek updates when warranted. So if there's a major signal or direction change in the middle of the week, we're not going to wait until the weekend to get you that information. We're going to get that information to you as soon as possible via a special midweek update email. The best fit for a Simple Market Signal subscriber is an investor or trader with at least a six to eight week plus time frame that they're focusing on. If you're a day trader or a really short-term trader, Simple Market Signals may help you a little bit, but the reality is Simple Market Signals is designed for those investors and traders with at least a six to eight week plus time frame that they're focusing on. And if you would like even more information about how you can benefit from Simple Market Signals, I have the following videos that will be linked in the description box below this video. And to subscribe to Simple Market Signals, you just need to go to the website that you see on the screen here. That's https colon two forward slashes simplemarketsignals.com. It'll take you about four minutes to subscribe. It's that easy.